So I, I've got the opportunity to do that because Dwayne quit a little bit early, so that gives me an extra 20 minutes for which I'm deeply grateful. I want you, if you will, to think about the Old Covenant over here and uh, the New Covenant over there. In the book of Hebrews, uh, the writer kept saying, God, we're going to make a New Covenant not like this one. He found fault with us. He made this one in the day when he took his people by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. And they broke the covenant and it didn't work. It was a covenant based upon fear and they had every reason to be afraid. When they were down in the land of Egypt, God uh, performed miracles that killed people. I mean, every firstborn animal, every firstborn son that did not have the blood on the lintel of the door, they died. They came out of the land of Egypt and uh, all the uh, Egyptian army died. Uh, and uh, Miriam was playing the tambourine and the dancing and the singing. Moses sang a song giving glory to God because he had killed the horse and the rider in the sea. So they come to Mount Sinai and they look up at that thing and the Lord told them, I want you to put a border around that mountain. Why? Keep people alive because a man or a beast that went beyond that border, they killed it. Didn't matter. No pity. No mercy was shown under the old covenant. And so the daddies get to look now, honey, I want to tell you something. See those borders over there? Don't you go. Don't you go. We'll have to kill you if you can keep your dog on this side. You know, uh, man or beast. If, if, you're, if you got your calf, you're out milking the cow, letting the cow graze, don't you let it get over yonder. Because if it does, we have to kill it. We have to kill you. Have to get, it, it was so frightening that Moses himself yeah, did exceedingly wait yes. and fear. It was an awesome experience. And while Moses was up on the mountain receiving the covenant, and it's over and over, you know, there are a bunch of covenants, a covenant with Adam, a covenant with Abram, a covenant with Noah, but uh, the, when the Bible talks about the old covenant in Hebrews 8, Hebrews 10, this is what it's talking about. It's talking about the Ten Commandments that God wrote with His finger in tablets of stone. And while Moses is up there in the presence of God, everybody else is too afraid to go up there, but he goes up there and he gets these commandments and it was as such an awesome experience because if you violated those commandments, you die. They're coming down, for example, he comes down and he sees an orgy going on there, a golden calf, people unrestrained naked before a golden calf. He said he went to the entrance of the camp so he couldn't get out. Who's on the other side? Amen. Who was it? Levi. Levi. I'll tell you something about Levi. If you're, you know, you're hiring somebody for a job, you say, give me a resume. Well, Levi said, here's my resume for the job of priest. You remember what she did to my sister? I chopped him in pieces for it. And his daddy. And the whole bunch. Me and my brother have done that. <laughs> We're going to make you a priest. <laughs> Who's on the Lord's side? He said, well, I am. He said, get your sword on. And go throughout the camp and tell every man his neighbor. Every man his brother. Every man his friend. And they did it. And about three thousand People died in one day. And they were killed by the Levites whom God set aside to be the priests under a covenant that was based upon fear. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You 
break that, we take you outside the camp in Estonia on the testimony of two or three witnesses. He blasphemed God. Remember, there was an Israelite woman who married an Egyptian, and her boy blasphemed God, and they went to the Lord and said, Lord, what are we going to do with this kid? Having juvenile delinquency problems. What are we going to do with this? Ask the Lord. So we have to put him in war, put him in jail. Okay, Max, I'm going to just stone him. Don't throw him into pity. Stone him. If a boy sassed his mama or his daddy, if a boy struck his mama or his daddy, the penalty was death. Found a man, Numbers 15 says, I found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath, Sabbath day. For the Lord said in the Old Covenant, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Not only you, but your children and your animals and every even a stranger. you got to do that to make God happy. You don't do that, God's not going to be happy with you. So they put this guy in ward at a jail, some kind of a restraining device to keep him in there. Lord, what are we going to do with this man? He violated your covenant. And the Lord said, kill him, stone him. Get a couple or three witnesses, you stone him. A man commits a murder, you murder and you execute him. Two or three witnesses enough. Woman commits adultery, you stone her to death. And it was a system designed, you know, when Moses came down, everybody was unrestrained. I mean, they're doing anything they wanted to do before a golden calf. The word is translated naked in Scripture, and it's also interesting enough in the 29th chapter of Proverbs where it says, where there is no vision, the people perish the same word. The people are unrestrained, and the word vision is not talking about dreaming about something happening next year. It's talking about where there is no revelation from God, the people are unrestrained. You need a word from the Lord to restrain people. So there was a word from the Lord and there was a restraining mechanism that tried to conform people to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And the Lord found fault with it. That's what the Bible says. Yes, yeah. It was weak and badly and the God who wrote it with his own finger found fault with it. Of course, he didn't do it as an eternal program. You know that. It was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. That's what the law was. The law was not given to save people. It was given that every mouth might be stopped. stopped and all the world become guilty. guilty. It worked. It worked. And, you know, I, I hear people saying, uh, I was listening to a tape the other day from somebody who was a Sabbath keeper and was trying to say that everybody lives under the Ten Commandments and the man was saying that you're not under the Ten Oh, you want to commit adultery. Is that what you want to do? Oh, you want to worship, you know. Well, I think the guy was digging a pit for himself because he doesn't keep the Ten Commandments. Do you? I mean, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Do you always put God first? The other end, thou shalt not covet anything that is thy neighbors. You always got a 100% record on that. What about honoring your father and mother? Oh, well. I, I struck out on that so many times I don't even want to count about honoring my father and my mother. I'm a sinner and I need a savior. But I don't tell you that fear is not enough to make people bold to enter in. It, it just it does not work that way. Uh, Victor Knowles put into one body, uh, I don't know whether he did or he's going to, I've forgotten now, but anyhow, I, uh, I wrote an article for the one body on, oh, it was in, it was in this recent issue, on the deteriorating effects of ritualistic religion. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, 
to the scribes and Pharisees, you know, you cut the sea and land. Here's a man's list. You cut the sea and land to make a proselyte. And when you get him all trained up, what about him? He's too full more of a child of hell than you are. And I said in there, didn't have time to develop it. I said, well, you know, the people were bad at Mount Sinai and worse when Jesus came. Yeah. Now, I, you know, but here was the way I think they were worse. When they were 1,500 years before Jesus, when the law was given on Mount Sinai, these people were so open, they just took their clothes off, they put a golden calf there, and what a lie that guy told. He says, well, I told them to bring their jewelry, and I just dumped it in there, and bam, this calf came out. <laughs> you know, the dog ate the homework. That's, that makes more sense than what Aaron said. But anyhow, uh, it was... Uh, it was the fact that the people, when Jesus was upon the earth, they were, I think, more wicked, but they were more clever and hypocritical, so that nobody saw them committing the dog. You know, they, here was a woman they caught in the act of adultery, and they didn't even bring the man in. They caught her in the act of adultery, they just brought her in. They said, Lord, we caught this woman in the act of adultery. Moses said she's to be stoned. What do you say? Well, one of the things I think the Lord probably said is, where's the guy? And may have written his name down in the ground uh, to the amazement of everybody who was there. But the point is, is that uh, Aaron was no saint. He was no great guy. But he was a whole lot better than Annas and Caiaphas, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it was just downhill. You know, the, a system built upon fear doesn't work and the Lord knew that it wouldn't work so he said I'm going to make a new covenant it's not going to be like that which I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt and they broke that covenant this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days said the Lord I'm going to write my laws in their mind I'm going to put them in their heart and they won't have to teach their children every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying know the Lord because you won't be in this covenant unless you know the Lord. You've got to be taught first to be in this covenant. You have to be born again. You have to receive the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. And when that happens, you are transformed born again. You know, the word transformation, you know this is metamorphosis. It's our metamorphosis. It's a Greek word which we brought into English. It's only found four times in scriptures. Two times it refers to Jesus on a mountain. Yeah. Now you've got to remember that the apostles were just kind of getting up to speed. Jesus, I've got a lot of things to tell you, but I can't tell you now. i got to do it a little bit at a time. I've got to ratchet this thing up so you'll understand what I'm talking about. And one of the things he did to prepare the apostles for what we now should see clearly, he took them up on an exceeding high mountain and all of a sudden, he didn't look like himself any longer. They were watching him. And as they were watching him, he was metamorphic. He went through like the caterpillar becoming the butterfly. He went through a metamorphosis. And these guys had never seen anything like that before. He was whiter than they had ever seen a fuller make anything white. It was the most, most remarkable experience. Jesus said, now don't talk about this till after I'm raised from the dead. This is something. This is exciting, but it's not going to happen until the Holy Spirit comes. And you just wait. Wait till after I'm raised from the dead to try and get this across to people. And the other two times it refers to you and me. Romans 12 says, do not be conformed. That's what the law tried to do. Tried to scare us into being righteous. Tried to scare us into not committing adultery. Scare us into not saying bad things about our parents. Scare us into not stealing. Scare us into not coming. And it didn't work. As we said before, there was a deteriorating effect that legalistic religion had upon the people. Some of the most legalistic churches, and you know this, Colossians 2, it has an appearance of wisdom, but it's of no value in checking the indulgence of the flesh. Amen. And if anything, it sometimes reflects. But when we preach on something all the time, we're burying our hearts and soul because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
Do you now know why Jimmy Swaggart always preached so much about prostitutes? Because that's what he was thinking about. That's what he was living out in his life. So, Lord, I'm going to deliver you from this kind of a system. Instead of taking a caterpillar and trying to make it so afraid that it'll learn to fly, that's a futile thing to do. Caterpillar never learned to do that. You let the caterpillar go through the metamorphosis and it has a new mind, new abilities, new desires. And in Canada, in the fall of the year, the monarch butterfly comes out of the cocoon and starts flying to northern Mexico or southern California or south Texas or Florida, never had a flying lesson, never had a navigation lesson, and it goes where its great-grandparents came from months before. I don't know how it does that, but God does, because God puts a new mind in the caterpillar when it becomes a butterfly. And the Bible says, if anybody is in Christ, he is a new creation. Amen. All things are passed away, and everything becomes new. Now, in the 10th chapter of the book of Hebrews, when the covenants come up again, the, the, the 10th chapter begins with something that has been of pivotal significance in my mind. It says that the law had only a shadow of, and not substance. The Hebrew people were students of the law. Jim Girdwood, when he was in town, said, and I quote him as my only authority, but he went through the Hebrew Union College and was an expert in a lot of areas like this. He said, boys, the devout Jew begins his study of Scripture by memorizing the book of Leviticus. Very common thing among devout Jews. And those who are really serious about the law of God memorize all the five books of law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So they were real students of the law. But just suppose that I stepped out on the parking lot or the sidewalk in front of the church house and you took a picture of my shadow and spread it. What would that tell you about me? <laughs> Probably not very much. You wouldn't know me from Dave or from Gibbon or from Mike or Leon or anybody else, you know, because shadows don't tell you very much about a person. And if you took the picture of my shadow at 12 or 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 every hour, every minute, my shadow would be changing and so were your and so was the law. The law of a shadow. If you and see the Jews who studied that didn't know Jesus, didn't know God. They didn't know God at all. All they knew was the shadow. That's why they crucified Jesus. You don't know the real nature of God from studying the shadow. Jesus is the light of the world. He is without a shadow, <laughs> without variation, or shadow cast by eternity. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you really want to know about God and the nature of God, you have to study about Jesus Christ. Amen. So the scriptures teach in the 10th chapter of the book of Hebrews that we enter in boldly into the holiest by the blood of Jesus Christ, by a new living way in which he hath consecrated for us through the veil. That is to say, his flesh. And i got to do a little commercial here. That scripture hit me so hard one day that I sat down and wrote a book about it and they're out in the foyer if you're interested. What is a, uh, what's a veil for? What is a veil for? To hide something. First time the word veil is used in the Bible, Rebecca put one on. She was coming from Payton now and she's going to marry Isaac. And his young camel did travel all day long, all week long, all month long. And they see a man, so who's that? That's going to be your husband. She lighted off the camel, leaned the car to me, and said that wasn't a cigarette. <laughs> she lighted off the camel and put on a veil so that her 
fiance couldn't see her. That's what a veil is for. Next time the word veil is used in scripture, Tamar put one on and had sexual relations with her father-in-law and he never even knew who it was. He fathered twins by Tamar, didn't even know who it was because she had on a veil. Next time the word veil is found in scripture is in the tabernacle. There was a holy place and there was a holy of holies and there were veils before but God didn't want you to see in there. That's what a veil is for. Now this hit me like a ton of bricks because I always thought that Jesus came to reveal God. Nobody has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son which is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Ex on is a great word, and it means he's explaining God. Jesus is the word of God. Nobody knew what God was like. Was he like a totem pole? Was he like a stone serpent? What was God like? Jesus, well, I'll show you what God is like. I'll be the vehicle to communicate God. I am the word of God. I am the exegesis of God. You look at Jesus, you know precisely what God is like. Amen. But Jesus was not, I mean, the real God is not flesh. God's a spirit. Mm -hmm. That's right. And the flesh of Jesus lasted 30 three years. He was born, you know, we talk about the life of Christ, the life of Christ in Bible college, we normally think about 33 years with a birth and nativity and the crucifixion and ascension. Well, that's the life of Christ, we say. Well, no. <laughs> Not really. Because Jesus said before Abraham was, Amen. I am. He has always been. Everything that has been made, He made it, and without Him was not anything made that was made. He is the origin of the creation of God, according to the book of Revelation, the beginning of the creation, King James said, but it's the word origin. He's the origin of the creation of God. Everything God made, He made through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So, what happens to most of us, and this is a point of the book, is that we are kind of, we kind of got a, a B.C. mentality in an A.D. world. The Hebrew people were afraid to have any kind of a personal encounter with God because they didn't want to die. Moses said, come on, I'm going to go up on the mountain. You want to go up on the mountain with me? No, you go up there. We don't want to go. We'll die. We go up there and see God, we'll die. High priest says, well, it's the day of atonement. I got all my robes. I've gone through all the purification ceremonies. Everything is just exactly like the scriptures teach it should be. I'm going to go in and meet God face to face in a sense. He's going to meet with us between the outstretched wings of the cherubim. Come on in. With no, ho, ho, ho. I remember what happened to Nadab and Abihu. I remember what happened to us. I'm not going in there. You'll die. You can't do that. So all these people had was second-hand testimony. Mm -hmm. Go to Aaron. Aaron, what was it like yesterday when you were in there? What did you hear? What did you see? Did you smell it? What was it like to be with God? He would tell you, you could appreciate his testimony, but you couldn't have one. You were denied access to God under the old covenant. You had to go to Jerusalem, you had to go to the tabernacle, you had to go to the temple, you had to go to the priest. You couldn't do it and they wouldn't trust you. It's interesting in Leviticus chapter 17 when they were making sacrifice, if you wanted to butcher a beef and you, just, you couldn't just butcher a beef at your own tent, they would excommunicate you for doing that. And the reason was they were afraid you were whoring after other gods. They were afraid you were making sacrifice to a pagan god. So in order for you to butcher your own beef, you had to go to the tabernacle and let the priest watch you do it. That's how little confidence they had in these people. And it was well founded because they had stony heart. They were unconverted people. The ox knew his owner and the ass his master's crib. They didn't know much. 
They needed a new mind. They needed a heart of stone taken away. And they needed a heart of flesh. But they didn't have that in those days. And they couldn't have it until Christ opened up a new way. Amen. Until he shed his blood. Until he made it possible for us to enter in boldly into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. And now it is possible for everybody. You know, it's interesting how we go from one extreme to another as a young preacher. I was legalistic. I remember Forrest Bailey used to quote about Revelation 22, 18, 19. I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, out of the holy city, out of the things that are written in this book. And I'd be in the hospital opening my Bible, and if I missed a word, I'd go back and read it in there. You know, excuse me, I've got to go back and say this sentence again, because I left out a word I didn't want to have the plagues added to me or the rewards taken away. And then, of course, you go to a third world country and you speak through translation and everything else. You say, dear Lord, I was kind of barking up the wrong tree, you know. The, the word of God's alive and active and sharper than a two-edged sword, and it can stand the stuttering, stammering preachers who sometimes miss a word accidentally. But uh, as a young preacher, I was very legalistic, didn't have uh, the boldness. And when I heard about personal testimony, it scared me to death, and I used to say, you know, I had stories, true stories about somebody that built a doctor. He said, man, I've never felt better in my life. The doctor gave me a clean bill of health, and then 10 minutes later, they're dead. You ever hear stories like that? A lot of times, heart attack victims. Just before they die, man, I'm feeling great. So I used to say, don't, it doesn't matter how you feel. What the Word of God says, you've got to have this thing in election. And I was opposed to experiences, afraid of experiences. I was afraid of experiences almost for the same reason that the Hebrew priest was afraid to go beyond the veil. I was comfortable with the veil. I could tell you about Jesus and the Samaritan woman of Jacob's well. I could tell you about Jesus and the parables. I could tell you about Jesus and the blind man. I could tell you about Jesus and the sea and how he calmed the sea. I could tell you all those stories just as the Hebrew priest could tell anybody about the Oh, what's this tall? Is this white? Is this blue? Is purple? Is this thick? It's got the cherry. It's got the cherry. I can tell you all about that veil. Well, let's go beyond it. Oh, no. <laughs> Don't go. Don't go in there. Something bad will happen to you. Well, when Jesus died, the veil was written to don't look, don't look. <laughs> Dear Lord, don't look. Anybody else that way? Now then, I'm just, now then I've done a series for the last 15 years over Good News on experiences. People have them. God willing, tomorrow, I won't down the tape. But God willing, tomorrow, Brother Gresham can't be here. We're going to have a testimony by Martha Huddleston. She and her husband were Christian church missionaries to Zaire for eight years. And uh, they were they are now with the Pioneer Bible Translators. A year ago, last uh, this summer, they were on campus at Ozark. And I went over to eat lunch with them and I sat down. Hi, I'm boys. Hello, I'm Martha. And in the course of our conversation, you know, she just said, well, when I had multiple sclerosis, I had all sorts of problems, whatever. I said, what do you mean, when you had multiple sclerosis? Oh, she said, I used to have multiple sclerosis. I said, how did you get over multiple sclerosis? I've never heard of anybody that got over multiple sclerosis before. She said, God healed me. But she said, that was the small miracle. I said, what was the big miracle? She said, it was in my marriage. I'd been married to Mark for 24 years and I didn't love him. And she said, I know this is going to sound terrible, but I used to pray that he would either commit adultery or die so that I could get out of that marriage. And then on January the 19th, 1995 she had an experience with God and you can't have you can't get pregnant over the telephone 
if you're going to know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're going to be born again, if you're going to receive Him into your heart, you have to have an intimate experience with God. You've got to go beyond the veil where God is. You can't get it secondhand from somebody else. Amen. You've got to go where God is in order to get it. She said, I prayed like Jacob at Peniel, and after hours and hours of agony and prayer, I had a peace overwhelm me, and I slept better than I had for 10 years. In the morning, Mark was teaching at the Summer Institute of Linguistics in Dallas, and she said, I said, Mark, I'd like to go to class with you today. All right, he said, I'll get your wheelchair. She said, no. Well, he said, I'll get your scooter. She had an electric scooter. No. Well, I'll get your cane. No, she said, I'm going to walk. And she did. Now, she said, I was weak on that first day. But now, she says, I walk two miles every other day, and I swim in between. And my marriage with Mark is like one continuous honey. The old covenant tries to scare the wife into submission and obedience. The new covenant gives her a different heart, different mind, different desires. You can't make a caterpillar fly. You can't do it. You can put it in class, you can put it in school, you can try all that stuff. And you'll never make a caterpillar fly. You can scare it all you want to. It cannot fly. It has the wrong kind of a nature. Mm -hmm. That's right. Jesus was born under the law. Galatians 4 4. Made under the law but he never was afraid well you know I, I don't want to be playing words here with you you know the Bible says he heard it that he was hurt and that he feared Hebrews 5 7 and talks about Jesus agonizing you know but the general picture of the Jew was honey don't do this don't go there don't say that they wouldn't even pronounce the name of God it was an ineffable name Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. That's what the Ten Commandments said. And these devout Jews were so intimidated and terrified they wouldn't even try it. Because if they messed up and mixed up the name of God, they were afraid they were going to die. They didn't even try it. Jesus came having a good time. Eating, drinking, friend of publicans and sinners. On the Sabbath day, walking through the grain field. Hey, fellow, let's have something to eat. Going into the synagogue, a woman bowed together for 18 years. I talked to a friend of mine here today, old Kim, by the way, uh, Catherine Metzger. Dear sister, she's gone to be with Jesus now, but she's lived over in Carthage, friends of our family for years, and Catherine Metzger was just like that. When her husband, Glenn Metzger, died, Richard, her only son, and I had to lift her up so she could see her husband. She was that bowed together. She could not even see inside the casket the body of her own husband. He got on one side of her. I got on another side. We lifted her up so she could see her husband before they put him in the ground. Jesus came into the synagogue and it was the Sabbath day. And here was this dear little sister, 18 years, bowed down like that. Jesus healed her. It made a man. There are six days in which a man ought to work. Jesus said, she's a daughter of Abraham. She's been bowed 18 years. You let an ass go get a drink. You let your ox get out of the ditch. Why, why can't I let her go? It is lawful to do well on the Sabbath day. 
and over and over and over in the scriptures. I wrote them down, but I don't want to bore you with it. He just said, they were amazed. They were astonished at his doctrine. He taught them with authority. He was a different kind of a teacher. The very nature of law makes you afraid, makes you intimidated. We had this court case just recently about sexual harassment or harassment, which I don't even know how to pronounce it. That's how ignorant I am. I don't know whether it's harassment or harassment. But anyhow, it's a big thing in the workplace. And so this guy had seen some sitcom on television. He came to work. He was talking about it. And he pointed to a dictionary, talking about some woman's body part, and he got fired. He made $95,000 a year. And the company was so afraid. So afraid by the legal round. Hey, dump the guy. Then he goes to court. How big was the settlement? It was a, yeah, it was a twenty-six point five million dollar settlement in his favor this time, and she was had to pay like one point three million. Of course, the courts. I don't, who knows what they're going to do with the thing? It's not over yet. But this illustrates the very nature of law that it intimidates. You. The scriptures teach that if you touch anything that has been touched by an unclean person, you become unclean. Leviticus 5, 2 and 3 says that. Even if you don't know it. You touch the carcass of a dead animal. Forgive me for being indiscreet, but if a menstruous woman touch the pew you're sitting in and you're a Jew, you're unclean. If somebody had touched a dead body and they touched the door, you open when you get, you become unclean. So the Jew touched not. <laughs> you go down and we ate in the lovely meal, you know, ham sandwiches. What was that you ate, you know? Uh, what, you eat a salad? Was there a snail in there? Uh, was there some rabbit? What, you know, the catfish? You know, there were so many. They touched not, taste not, don't handle. You know, the Jews lived a very restricted life. Now, Jesus was so happy. He was going around. He had the freedom to do whatever God led him to do. And they were astonished. They were amazed. They were amazed with great astonishment at what Jesus was doing. But here's the genius of the new covenant. He says, I'm going to put my spirit in you. Mm -hmm. Amen. When I prayed, I said, Daddy. That's what Jesus prayed in Gethsemane. Abba! They wouldn't even try to pronounce the name of God. Jesus said, Abba, I need some help. He sent an angel. He didn't abandon his son. He sent an angel to strengthen and help him there. And when you receive Jesus into your heart, when you become intimate with him, when you're born again, when you receive the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse you from all sin, you have confidence and boldness to cry out, Abba, Father. The Holy Spirit takes away the slave mentality. You're no longer a slave. You're a child. You're an heir and a joint heir with God. Amen. I'm going to close by quoting a poem that probably been the most popular poem I've ever quoted and I, I memorized it by accident. We got a little record for our daughter Mary and uh, she played it over and over and over and over and I absorbed this poem by osmosis. <laughs> Called Mary Had a Little Pig. Mary had a little pig and it was white as snow. That is when it had had a bath as you of course might know but Mary had an awful time to keep that piggy clean and it was just the dirtiest pig that one had ever seen. She'd wash him and she'd scrub him till he'd squirm and squeal as if he wanted her to know it was an unfair deal. And then in the green backyard he'd play from morning until night unless he'd happen to slip right out and lose himself from sight. For Mary thought and wondered much what she could ever do. Then she figured out a plan. And this she carried through. She took him to a doctor who put the pig to sleep. Then he took his heart right out. But not of course to keep. And then he took a little lamb and took his heart out too and put it in the little pig before the piggy knew. And when the piggy did awake, he had no more desire to wallow in the mud again or ever in the mire. And so you see, boys and girls, 
we need a new heart too just like the little piggy did the old will never do Amen.